and you are very welcome to Writer's Block with Miriam. My name is Miriam Ogarika Murray. And I'm so excited because I have one of my childhood favorites, a legend. Alison Arngrim is in the house. Alison, you're very welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. I love your like slide there with my picture. All your That's slides. A- look, you looking at your best. Wonderfully crazy picture I took. I took that picture. I was like, this is so nuts. Me and the photographers were fooling around. And then, of course, everyone loves it. I'm like, okay, great. Now it's going to run everywhere. And it's like, oh, oh, I know. It's fantastic. I'm just going to take off my necklace here. It has decided to slip off. Crop malfunction, right? <laughs> well, I look, I have all off during a show. I was doing my stand up. Oh, no. <laughs> and the earring literally just went rattled to the floor, and I went, oh, screw it, and threw off the other one and kept going. So it was like, what do you do? <laughs> this is what happens. You just keep going. Well, I have read this most absolutely amazing book. Now, everybody at home, just for posterity's sake, We are recording in COVID-19 and it is the 15th of April, 2021. And like so many people, a lot of us started reading again, which is a fantastic thing. And one of the most funny, incredible biographies, memoirs that I I picked up was Alison Argrams. I'll just catch my camera here. Confessions of a Prairie Bitch. It is just so well written, Alison. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. I worked on it. It's hard. <laughs> I bet you did as well. But really, you know that as an actress and as someone who's used to write, writing stand up, because Alison is a stand up comedian. She's been that since she was about 16. I won't give away too much more of the book, though. But it's, it's just so clear that you're used to writing. You're used to different kinds of text and script. And it's almost as though that, that has just fed into the book. You know, it's just amazing. How did you get, who, did anyone push you to write the book or was there a moment Everybody. when? <laughs> <laughs> it was, it, people have been saying to me since I was a child, because, well, having read the book, you know, my life was so absolutely off the charts strange that even as a kid, people would say, I hope you're writing all of this down. Even when I was quite young, people would meet my parents and meet me and said, you're taking notes, right, kid? And people would say, hope you're writing a book when you grow up. And people were always saying, hope you're writing this down. And then as I started doing stand up, and of course I was on Little House, people said, God, you need to do a book of this. And so as soon as I was an adult, people kept saying, when are you writing a book? I mean, all my life, people said, you must write a book. And that was before I was even an adult. Um, and they didn't even know half the things that were happening. So I started sort of taking notes and I had, a, and I took writing classes in high school that I didn't even go to half the time. It was awful at, but I was always, always writing. And then I was writing stand up. And then I began making more notes. And then as I got older, people said, God, you really, really got to write a book now. When um, I started doing the one woman show in yes. 2000, Confessions of Prairie Bitch, where I had, well, as I talked about in the book, I was booked into New York City and they said, you need to do an hour and a half. And I'm like, I don't have an hour and a half. Who has an hour and a half? That's a lot. Yeah. Well, Los Angeles stand-up comics who play the comedy store in the improv, you tend to do 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Yeah. If you're the headline, you're like, yeah. oh, I got a hot 20 minutes. But yeah. the idea that you would get up and do an hour and a half, is that, that never happens. So nobody has an hour and a half. And I thought, well, I, I could do question and answer. They're always asking questions. Well, what if I, and I wound up writing this an epic hour and a half show this one woman show and I thought I'm telling all true stories well I did it of course and people loved it and I said well that's that and then I began writing like the long version of the stories that I yes. told them so in book form and I began working on this and that's when Kent Kent uh, D. Wolf a literary agent came to the show and he'd he'd heard that Nellie Olson did he said oh I heard he'd heard the actress who would play Nellie Olson did a show and it was really funny so I was like oh my god I saw her she's funny and he thought I should go and so he just he bought, walked in off the street bought a ticket and uh <laughs> I, 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 my father was my, like my father when I got a book to my father said I got a literary agent he said someone introduced you to an agent I said no he said uh you did a showcase for agents I said no he said are you telling me a literary agent simply walked it off the street and bought a ticket? I said, yes, yes, he did. And marvelous guy. We met, we talked. Next thing I know, he says, yes, I want to, rep- I want to, is there a book of this show? I said, there could be. And he said, can you send me four chapters? And I, oh, had, I, had, I had four I, chapters. Okay. I didn't know it had happened that way around. I knew most people write the book and do the show. I didn't do yeah, the yeah. show and wrote the book because I'm weird like that. Nothing ever goes exactly the direction it's supposed to go. <laughs> they're like, wait a minute, you did the show and then you wrote the book. Yeah, I know, right? Okay. So 
he said, is there a book to go with this? I said, well, there could be. And, and that's the thing. I had four chapters, which is like amazing that I had four chapters. I don't know why I had four chapters, but I had four chapters. I think I had five. And I sent him, he said, yeah, I can take this in. And so next thing I know, I'm heading back to New York. And he says, well, I've set up some meetings. And then he rattles off the names of all like these huge publishers. And I was, I was in shock. I was literally in shock. And so wow. we wound up marvelous harper collins and um then of course it, that's the fun part then they said good now go write the rest of it ah! um, um and then i did and then that handed it and then the fun part okay now we're going to edit it and then it's getting fun. okay um we've decided to merge these four chapters in one so could you now write like another 10 pages to link this to this sure when tonight oh all right then and this oh. went on <laughs> months months and months so then the rewrite that was crazy as hell so I, I kept thinking I thought editing meant cutting not adding they're like hey. um so <laughs> I wrote thousands of pages and then wind up writing more pages in the editing process it's a lot of work and then they someone calls back and says well the editors looked at it and they really really love this chapter and they want more about this I'm like that that's that's the thing you like wait that's the part you like you want more of that I know. and yeah it was, it was very strange. The things you think they're going to like, no, the things that they turn out they love and you need to expand are, are the subjects you go, really? Really? That, that's the, uh, all right. <laughs> yeah. So all in all, how long did it, how long did it take? I guess a year and a half. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. It, sounded, it was like about eight a month or so to write the thing and then the editing thing. The editing part seemed to go on forever. It actually was only several months, but it seemed like two years. Uh, and then, and then there was like you know, and then you have to talk to the legal department, and then there's the discussion of the cover art and yeah. all the things that go. It is amazing the stuff that goes into a book. People yes. have no idea of yeah. the work involved, the complications involved. And thank God I had the fabulous agent because I would call him and go, "What? What? I have to do what? What? Wait, but." And they go, no, it's okay. It's like, just breathe, breathe here. This is how we do. And then, oh, good. Now we need the, the prologue. We need an introduction. Okay, right, right. Got it. And then literally my father is in the hospital and has just died. And they called me and said, we're just wrapping the whole thing up. It's great. We need to do an epilogue. And we realize your father died, um, you know, last night. But could you write about that in the epilogue and wrap the whole thing up? And we realize this sounds odd, but the character of your father, the things you say about your father, they said, we have people here at the publishing house saying, but what happened, what happened to the crazy dad? What happens to the crazy father? Yeah. And um, literally you need to write about that. Went, All right then. Um, so yeah, the things oh my God. you wind up doing in the writing of a book, especially a memoir, most people cannot even imagine how far out it gets. Yes. But we did it. We did it. We pulled it off. I did it. They did it. The editor, the thing, my agent. And um, thank God I had him to hold my hand. Thank God I had my husband to make more pots of yeah. coffee. And Bob. Bring me <laughs> Bob. And, to, and to proofread. He's like, I'm going to proofread this thing. Um, yes. It was amazing. So um, pulled it off. And yes, I just, it was absolute. I remember being drenched in sweat. It was like digging ditches. It was, yes, it was well, I'm sure your father, having read the book and, and you talk about your father's character and he had such drive and he was so creative, he must have carried you through it. He must have pushed you all the way. Well, there's absolutely, I mean, there was that attitude of, as he said, when he couldn't believe it, when he realized that an agent walked in, he said, see, I told you, you got to hang your ass out there. <laughs> and it's like, well, um, yes. You did. <laughs> And, and Bob still laughs about that when something oh happens or I get a project or I'm doing all this online stuff and something works. And Bob says, see, there you go. You hung your ass out there. Aren't you glad? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know. I know. But, you know, I remember um, gosh, we're Generation X. So it was really unusual to see quite a number of kids in a television series all become stars, all have memorable yes. names. Yeah, and it wasn't just one in the series. It was you had the protagonists and the antagonists. And, you know, as much as I know she was nasty Nelly and everything, she was loved. <laughs> she was perfect. You know, she was just great. And let's Thank face you. it, my, my friend Una always says that she's a singer as well as myself. She always says, oh, Mary, got Alison, Argrimon, look, come on. We all knew a Nelly. All of us knew a Nelly. 
Yes, see, that's why the show, because people say, why on earth are people still watching Little House on the Prairie in 140 countries, 8,000 million years later, 46 years later? And I've asked because I meet people from, you know, Sri Lanka, from from uh, Borneo, from Bangladesh, from, uh, as I talked about in the book, Israel, Iran, Iraq, and I'm like, why are you all watching it? What does, what does a covered wagon full of blonde, blue-eyed Americans mean when you're in Sri Lanka? What does, what does this even mean? And they all say the same thing. They said, well, people can identify. They're poor. They have a lot of kids and live in a tiny house. Most people aren't living like, you know, Dynasty in Dallas and soap operas. They're living yes. like that with the farming. And, and they said, and boy, everybody had a Nelly at school. Everybody's got a Mrs. Olson at their job. Yes. This we can identify with. Yes. And I said, I got a point. <laughs> oh my gosh. Absolutely. And, and you're huge in France as well. It, they really took you to their heart, didn't they? blew my mind. I always wanted to go to France as a kid. You know, I'd read books that, where the characters were in Paris, you know, those kind of stories. And, and I loved French food and I thought I liked French movies and French. Yes. I thought, oh, let's go to France. And so I finally get to go. They go, come, you'll be on this talk show. And I get there. And they're, they're obsessed with Little House in the Prairie. Yes, I get, they I were. Continue. I like it. That I, I tell people, I said, if you're walking in the park with three or more French people and you pass a meadow, one of them will scream, I am baby Carrie, and run and fall down. <laughs> it's, I have never seen a group of people so mad for Little House. They the were, and, and I can actually, I can endorse that because I, the first country that I migrated to, we're, we're speaking in Ireland now, I, I'm coming to you right. from Ireland, but I migrated uh, in 1986 to Paris. I was oh. four years there and I lived in the south of France for a year at one stage too. And you're absolutely right. They loved it. It was all over the television <laughs> right oh. the way into the 90s. It started and it went, because it's still running every day at noon. It's like still on every day at noon. I finally like probably said, all right, what's going on? They said, well, remember in the 70s when the show started. And usually if a show's on the 70s in America, it doesn't get to like France or the rest of Europe to like 80 something. But somebody ran the pilot of Little House really early on, like 76 or 7. And it was a smash. They ran it at Christmas and that whole thing with Mr. Edwards bringing the Christmas presents. Yes. A little, yes. They went nuts. They, they dubbed it to French. They ran it and people went, we want the show. We want the show. So they wound up quite early for that kind of syndication running Little House in France. There were what, three channels, two channels at the time? Yeah. Only three yeah. They didn't even have the four channel. They didn't even have, you know, they had like France one, France two. They, there yeah. was no M6. There was no cable. So it was three channels. And at lunchtime. French people go home for lunch. They still, in, in small yes. towns, still go home for lunch. And children yep. will sometimes still come home from school for lunch. Yep. In the big city, they'll go to the break room. But instead of watching the soap operas, watching Little House on the Prairie. So it, at lunchtime, it was like, do you want to watch the news? Or do you want to watch Little House on the Prairie? And that's what was on every single day at noon. The whole country went home for lunch. So the whole country <laughs> all sat down and went. <laughs> and this is it. This is it. Upset. You're so right. And of course, it's two hour lunch breaks. So they can watch like two episodes. Now, now they get a lunch break. They watch, they watch Little House and Highway to Heaven. Now they catch it. Now they go, oh, Highway to Heaven's on. Route du Paradis. Um, so yeah. That that long, and, and it's one of the few shows where they kept the title. You know, the French do that thing where they'll change the title. So it That's makes right. sense. Language. Yeah. La Petite Maison dans la Prairie. It's, it's the same. They didn't yeah, change it. yeah, that's very unusual for them to do that. They will find a French word if they have to. Right, they, they won't even use the word computer. But I love them. Well, I'm not criticizing you, France. I love you, France. You're well, but also, like a lot of movies, our movies will have things that are, you know, catchphrases or idiom, and it they're like, what? What is that even? So they had to change the title because they didn't know what the heck we're talking about. But Little yes. House on the Prairie made sense. Yes, and yes. they kept it. it was and easy. I have never seen people who had a show so memorized and, and different ages. Because in the U.S., it's more women than men watched it. People yes. our age. And then the younger, the 40s and the 30-somethings. In France, I've met, like, teenage boys who watch Little House on the Prairie. Teenage boys don't watch Little House on the Prairie in America. Well, <laughs> maybe like, maybe it was Michael Landon and his braces and his, you know... <laughs> You never know. They all watch it. And I just I'm amazed at how many people, different groups, like I would say, you're not our demographic. <laughs> but, they, yeah. they all, but in but France, they end up friends. being, that is very, it's very, very true. But at the, the, I think the casting was superb, right down to the reverend, you know, yep, yep. utterly oh, brilliant yeah. casting. And also this, they, they all had this layered aspect to them. And even the, the guests who came in, 
was mm-hmm. extremely good casting. And a lot of that was Michael. I mean, uh, Susie Sukman, who became Susan McRae, she was the main casting director and she was brilliant and worked for years. But Michael oversaw a lot. And there were a lot of people that Michael just picked, that Michael just said, I want this person on the show. It's like, oh, I guess we're having them on. I mean, I didn't I didn't read for network. I don't know how many people had to be cleared by network, but I never read for network. I was I came in an audition and he was like, you, and I, that was hired. Um, and there were people like, uh, well, Matt Laberto was already on the show playing Albert. And yes. it was time to bring in the character of the kind of Andy Garvey. So his brother was brought in, um, uh, uh, the Matt, Pat, Matt and Pat Laberto. Pat Laberto came in and read. He came down to the set. There was a callback. He came down to the set. And he said, can you come down? We just want you to read one more scene. We think we're going to go with you. Is you're perfect for Andy Garvey. Besides, your brother's already here. And they read him and they said, okay, you're hired. Can you get into wardrobe? They not only had him come down the set for a callback, they hired him and put him to work that afternoon. <laughs> like what? Who does this? What television? When does it happen? And uh, Michael and the whole thing with um Keddie, with Keddie Lester was uh Hester Sue, the singer. Keddie Lester, who sang Love Letters up straight from the heart, and was yes. pop. They met on some TV movie, and he said, Would you like to be on Little House in the Prairie? And she said, well, you know, I'm not really an actress. I've done this and that. I'm really a singer, I'm not really an actress. He said, I didn't ask you that. I said, Do you want to be on Little House in the Prairie? And like he had to practically convince her, so this is coming. And like, and then she's on the show. So there were things that were done that wouldn't be done now. Now you would have so many executive producers and the network and so many people involved. You wouldn't have one person like Michael Landon going, yes. "I just decided that we're having an episode about this, and we're having so and so on." Oh, yes. are we now? <laughs> which, I know so that happened a lot, which didn't doesn't happen now. Yes. Yeah, it is extraordinary that a couple of people have said that to me in the past when it came to the movies that they'd been in. If you if the same project was being staged today, it would be so complicated. You couldn't produce it the same way at all. And it would be yep. so much harder. So and Michael, much harder I remember he was, he was directing, he was writing, he was the executive producer, he was the star. Plus he had a piece percentage of the show. He got five paychecks. Um, and, but he oversaw things. I remember they had a new dress. I was wearing a new wardrobe thing. It was when um, we moved to Winoka and Nellie was going to a private school. So, and they marched me out to where he was sitting in makeup and he looked me up and down and laughed because I had this huge bow. And I think he said, you look like a Polish playboy bunny. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it's fine. But literally, they would drag and go, how's this? And he'd look at costumes and like, no, I don't like the shirt. I would like, yeah, he would, if he had said, I hate it, take her back and put her in something else that they, they've had to. They'd have done it. Isn't that yeah. amazing? And I think that was the Christmas party, wasn't it? That your father and just. <laughs> That's the party. That's our gate crashing party. That's the one we crashed the party. That's why Michael is like, has that look on his face. Like he's laughing and smiling, but he's also like, how did these people get in here? <laughs> I know they were not invited. They were not invited. They're not on the list. <laughs> Howard, and uh, we're like, hi, I'm here. Oh, but I got my picture taken with everyone. I have pictures in that party with like Will Gear and Karen Valentine and Barbara Eden. It was, it was amazing. It was an amazing that was, party. That was an amazing party. And your father looked amazing in it too. It was a lovely picture of him. I just want to go to um, yeah. this rather beautiful shot. It's from the book um, of your, your mother and your father. Just bring it up there. This is in the late 50s, I think. It, it's um, yeah, yeah. Or early 50s. Both on, yeah. the, on the stage. He was a very and handsome yeah, man. Oh, yeah. Well, both my parents are very good looking people. Yeah. So um, well, my mother actually once said, yes, that's why I married your father, because he looked like Laurence Olivier. Um, and he, he does, actually. In fact, there's a portrait I have of him, a lovely photo portrait, close up of him I have hanging. And people have said, why do you have a picture of Laurence Olivier hanging in your hall? I'm like, father <laughs> like, oh, my wow. father and, he's my father um, but that one is so funny they did a lot of comedies together and there's some hilarious pictures of them from that era at like the totem theater where they're doing shtick and i love the look she's giving she's off the side going yeah. Yeah, really um but yeah that i love that one because it so sums them up because as a manager he was always on the phone so he's on the phone and she's off the side going seriously and i mean that's that is absolutely the two of them right there so, She's in his head, even though he's in his head. <laughs> oh my gosh. But she had an incredible radio career. She yes, played the cartoon. voice of Casper. I was just looking at her the other day here because I have um I was just Davy and Davy David and Goliath. David and Goliath. There's a book yeah. um, 
magic behind the voices and it's she's got how let me see how huge is her chapter she has a whole oh, yes. chapter in the big book of like everyone who was ever in cartoons it's like the encyclopedia of ever everybody who was ever in a cartoon oh, look. and she's got yeah she has an entire chapter she has a whole chapter that just goes on and on and on and on and on with all the crap because she was cast by the friendly ghost she was gumby she was sweet polly she was gumby. Red, underdog's yes. girlfriend Yes. And Davy of Davy and Goliath. Also, I have, I have some on my little. Oh, um, so, look! <laughs> you have to have Gumby and everyone. So, yeah, she did them all. And her big break was the first family album in 62 or whatever it was. She, uh, there was a comedy album made about the Kennedys, about yes. JFK. And and Jackie and Jack Jackie giving a tour of the White House and and uh, talking about the toys all over the house and and Kenny saying the rubber swan is mine and little Caroline saying these talks do him so much good and it's the whole Kennedy family and it's very silly and at the time it was a big deal they hadn't really done a comedy album about a president or his family no one oh. had done that it was new and no one oh. and and a lot of the record companies said we're not sure if we can do this besides people like jfk they like kennedy they yeah. like john Kennedy's family. We, are we really going to make an album making fun of them and it was so mild i mean by today's standards it was so yeah. soft but it was hardly making fun but they were like i don't know if we can do this and of course it was one of the biggest hits ever it made the literally made the guinness book of world records for fastest selling album I think oh it didn't gosh. beaten out until like Thriller or something years later. I mean, it was like that huge. And my mother had no idea it was going to be. She did Little Caroline and John John. She did Children's Voices. <laughs> and of course, it blew up like nothing has ever blown up. Oh, and oh. then she got to do every cartoon she wanted, whatever she liked after that. And, and what I loved in the book is that the, the way your your father, even though they, they knew each other on stage, your father had no idea that she had this side to her. No. <laughs> until Nobody she knows. actually put it forward in a meeting yeah, they, they were at a meeting and they got a, this huge it was such a big deal my parents told me about they said they were trying to get a meeting with this this radio producer in toronto when they first moved there and they were all going to get jobs in radio and they took Stuart, the other guy from the theater and they were all raring to go and they were like we finally got this meeting we're all but we're set this is the guy who can hire everybody and they all carry about well what do you do and my father and Stuart had done a little bit of radio so they're saying well i was in this and i was in that and they're going great guns and then my mother's just kind of sitting, she had not done anything yet. And the man said, and what do you do, dear? And she said, I do children's voices. And my father and Stuart nearly had a fit when they got yeah. out of like, what are you talking about? You've never even done a radio show. What are you crazy? What did you just make that up? And of course, then the guy hires all three of them and she plays the child in the soap opera and it's the biggest part. It's all about the kid. And she did do children's voices and she did them so brilliantly. She was in every radio show they had. And then in New York, she was every child in every cartoon, including playing Kit President's children on a comedy album. And, and from what I understood from the book, a lot of those overlapped, didn't they? And, and, and she was pregnant at one stage, wasn't she? When she was having to... And running back and forth to the yeah. studio. And the, the Kennedy album is when she, it's funny because she looks so young on the cover, they're all standing in front of the, the fake White House or they're on a lawn and she's got a balloon and knee socks and she's, she's like 40 and she's already had me. She's like, you know, she's just like had a baby and it's, it's looking like she's 12. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Now your own career from 16, even though you're, you're still playing Nellie in The Little House on the Prairie, You've already started stand up. That was, it was so weird. Again, it's like, you know, I, I loved comedy and you know, I used to watch Carol Burnett show and all those things as a kid. And oh God, Flip Wilson. So I loved, I liked stand up and comedy, but, but uh, my father was managing comedians and we were at a club and I, I kind of was sort of, well, he, the guy was doing audience participation. I was giving him a hard time because I was 15. <laughs> and yes. he said one of those things like, well, if you think this is so easy, you ought to try it. And I was like, that's a good idea. And luckily we had all these comedians. So I met with these friends of mine my, that my father managed who were comedians and writers, brilliant, brilliant people. Next thing I know, I'm up on stage at a club at 15. At 15? <laughs> And it went really well because we thought, well, we'll try it out. And that was the thing is people roared with laughter and went, wait, that was pretty good. That wasn't like a 15 year old doing comedy. That was like a regular act. That was like a hit. I guess I think we're doing this. Yeah. <laughs> and then that was it. But, but you knew, you knew intrinsically that this was actually something that you, you could do, oh. you enjoyed. 
the joke was I couldn't sing or dance, you know, because people all had something they did. And I said, well, I can't sing and I can't dance. Well, I can't do stand. Well, I can tell jokes. And then when we did the stand, and then I began to learn exactly how it was done because I was working four nights a week all over town. We'd, I'd do a one club and my dad would throw me in the car. We'd go across town. I'd do another set. I mean, it was yeah. absolutely insane. Then get up in the morning and go to school or go to work. Amazing. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. It's just amazing. But now, Alison, j- just for everybody at home, Alison has her own show. It's called the Alison Arngrim Show. And it was, I, I, I was just, I caught your Wesley Orr interview and I caught your Martha Bolton interview the Martha, other day. Martha, yes. Oh, oh wow. Oh, with his first oh. female writer. Can you imagine? Oh, my God. But I never realized he was such a lovely man. Bob Hope, she, she, this lady, Martha Bolton, wrote for Bob Hope for many, many years. And she just, I, I mean, I don't know what age she is now, but she looks so young. It's hard to believe that she was actually yeah, she writing for him. Dillard, she worked with Joe Rivers. She yes. was going on all the things she'd done. And it was, you had to start to go, my God, this woman's been around forever. <laughs> and she's fantastic. Um, but yeah, it's that thing. I only worked with Bob Hope well, like twice. I did that telethon. I met him there. And I remember thinking he's exactly like he is on TV. And she said, yes, no, there wasn't a separate one. There wasn't like, okay, here's the public Bob Hope and the private Bob Hope. It was just the one guy. That was it. That was that. What you saw was what you got. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I am. I know Morecambe and Wise. There are some some really, really famous comedians in the United Kingdom who were exactly the same. You know, they were, you, you met them and it's, you know, what, what you got was. Is it? Was You're it? Like, oh, wow, that was that the really same person. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. Now you, I, I, so your show, I mean, you mentioned. Oh, just oh. I got interviewed. I've been getting interviewed since I was like six. So it's sort of, you know, revenge. Now I get to interview people. It's kind of fun. I know. <laughs> it's brilliant. And you're so good at it. It is Thank really you. Thank you. It really, really is. So uh, Alison Argram show. Now you can actually, you can go to the channel, channel one. Um, and it is also available through your Facebook page as well. But channel yeah. one, UBN, radiotv.com is where you'll find it. But also Alison has her own Facebook page. Yeah. Up there, and she does her Facebook live on a regular basis where you're reading and you're reading from the it's little Jay. house of the prayer. I love it. Jay, we were, we I thought, love it. I read um all the little house books because when the pandemic started, and I said, yes. I don't know what I'm gonna do. And my husband said, You'll think of something, you always think of something. Yeah. And I thought, I should go back and read the little house books since I'm stuck home and everything I was doing was canceled. I had all these gigs and they were all canceled, of course. And then I thought, Well, I should read everybody else is stuck at home, I'll, I'll, I'll read them on Facebook. So I yeah. put on a bonnet and came out and said, well, we're going to read book one and page one. So we, I read all the little house books. Then I read like Laura's daughter, Rose wrote about, I read like all of Rose's stuff. I read books about Laura Ingalls. Then we got bored and we read, we read some of Anne of Green Gables. And then I started yes. reading the Wizard of Oz series, like several of the Wizard of Oz books. But then we came around one year anniversary. I'd been reading every day at one thirty for a year. And uh, everyone said, we've got to go back. So I said, all right. So we started over at a little house and now I'm back on Farmer Boy. <laughs> and um, today I just read about um, breaking the calves, uh, a little uh, Almanzo with his little cows. I know. It's so wonderful. And sometimes you get two chapters. You sometimes get two. If you're good, you get two chapters. And then um, everyone started clamoring for cooking videos. They said, can you really make cinnamon chicken yes. like show? And I was like, yeah, yeah. I, and that's the thing. My, my father taught me to cook. I've always cooked. But Nellie couldn't cook, which is all terribly funny because in real life I can cook. And then Nellie, of course, couldn't cook. So it was very silly. So I said, okay, fine. I've always wanted a cooking show. As a little girl, I would watch Julia Child and the Galloping Gourmet. Yes. So now every Monday around 11, I go in the kitchen. We turn the thing on and go. And today we're going to make scrambled eggs. And um, we're doing, I think we're doing pancakes on Monday. Oh, lovely. It was it was cheese la- um, last time, wasn't it? You With did grilled cheese. cheese, yeah. Grilled cheese, yeah, that was lovely. That was, I was drooling. Great. <laughs> it was great. It was really It good. was really great. Yeah. But I I had a, a thought as I was reading the book, particularly um, but there was a section, if I can just go to it here, if I can just find out where, where it was, just for a second there. Um, you had... Now it's back up here, page I think it was 218. You were talking about, basically you were talking about being on your own. Mm. When you had finished The Little House of the Prairie, and of course you're an adult now, 
but thankfully, um, you know, the royalties are starting to come in. You manage to get your own apartment, you get yourself and, and things are for the first time in a long time because you were working so hard. It was, you know, work, 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 work. And other things had happened to you in your life as well. Um, and, and really, you just worked your way through it. You worked your way through the trauma. And suddenly, now you have this hiatus where you're able to actually do nothing for a while. And you don't have to work if you don't want to in this particular phase of your life. And you've got friends and you're doing your cooking. And, this, and life is, is, is pretty good, but you're not at the grind anymore. And suddenly you've got time to think. Yep. And everything and if, catches up with you when yeah. you're like a workaholic, you go, 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 go and go, oh, all these terrible, traumatic, awful things have happened. Well, I have to go to work now. And then you stop. And I was actually, it was actually a wonderful position. On the one hand, I felt like I was having a nervous breakdown because everything caught up with me. Everyone went, let's just not think about that right now. All caught up with me in my childhood, having been abused, everything that ever happened. And suddenly it was like, oh, we have time to be alone with our thoughts. <gasps> and it all caught up with me. Now, I was in a very, very, very fortunate position because, one, I had this period where I wasn't working. There wasn't that much to do. And because I was getting residuals from Little House, we did qualify for residuals. I made money. I had enough money to afford a therapist. I know so many actors where things happen to them and they, you know, and many people who abused as children, they get to adulthood and they have time to go to therapy. They don't have any money to go to a therapist. And in America, we don't have national health like that. You, can't, yep. you have to pay to go to the therapist. Um, yeah. Same here in Ireland. You've got to pay. We don't have a, the same so thing they do in England. That. Well, they, you know, you're stuck and it's the people, they don't have the money to go to the shrink. And then if they have the money, they don't have the time. And I thought, well, I had the time. And I actually had enough money that I was able to pick up the phone and, you know, and, and say, well, okay, I need to see someone talk about this and find some re pretty good too. And actually talk about what had happened for the first time to an actual professional who could say, okay, um, it's actually amazing. You're not in much worse shape. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. My first, it's so funny. I go to the therapist and she says, hmm, after I laid everything out, and she said, could you come in three times a week? And I said, that bad? And she said, uh, yeah, pretty much, actually. I'm kind of amazed or like even standing here. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I guess I've become. So I remember being really excited when she said you could come in once a week. Now I'm like, really? really? Uh, yeah. so, but it was amazing. So I, things tended to, in my life, to sort of time out that things would happen when it was a good time to happen. It wouldn't seem like it at the time, but then I'd go, wow, that was amazing that I hit that point where just when everything got awful, I suddenly also had a bunch of time and enough cash to be able to pay the doctor. Uh, yeah, a That's cushion. Like amazing that that happened. So, yeah. Yeah, just, it, just amazing. And, and it made me think about the pandemic at the moment and how, you know, so many people's lives will just come to, have come to a, a halt, whether they liked it or not. And uh, you can imagine the amount of people in similar situations or, you know, oh, maybe not children, maybe quite a, old, kids are fact. having a hell of a time. But people are having a hell of a time because, indeed, a lot of people, if they were kind of on the edge, they were having problems, they'd had a difficult life and they had medication or they had therapy or they were about to go into therapy. Well, the pandemic hit. They're in the house, and some of them, if they, especially if they have any sort of medical fragile issue, they have diabetes, or so they really, really can't go out, yes. and they're stuck at home. Yeah, and they, and therapy via Zoom calls just not the same. And no. if they didn't, and if their only health insurance to their job, and that just went bye bye. Oh yeah, we've got a, we've got quite the crises over here. I have friends right. They said, you know, I was like really like wound up before. You can imagine what I am now with this all happening and threat of death, and I'm in my house. I'm climbing the walls. Um, it was very, very, very difficult. People were alone. People were suddenly who al lived alone. Yes. And and they had contact with friends, but this is suddenly they're stuck in their apartment. There's the four walls. Horrible, horrible. I it's been very hard on people. And it has. We, and we've been so lucky at our house. My husband kept his job because. He's working for this company that's building the people mover down at the airport. And they said, oh, your company is infrastructure. And when it first hit, they said, we're not sure if we're closing. He literally, he went to work, said, I don't know if I'm coming home at noon. because Maybe we're closed. We don't know, really. I'm going to go in. I'll find out. I'll let you know. I go, are you guys closed? He goes, no, 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 no. And then they said, oh, we're infrastructure. We're considered essential. Everybody stays on. Do you want to work at home? Do you want to come in? 
And he said, well, my boss is going in, so there'll be hardly anyone there, but like him, me, and a couple people, it'll be the safest place in town to be. Yeah. Nobody can in from the outside. We'll have our masks. It's only a few people. I'm like, do it. So that meant, yay, health insurance, regular check. So he was able, as he said, oh, I have done all of the things exactly the same. And oh, the only change literally is I just wear a mask now for everything I'm doing. I'm in a mask and I have hand sanitizer, but I'm, I've been going all the same places. And so that was great. And then, well, I so, was booked. I was, I was supposed to come to Ireland, as you know, I was supposed to come to Ireland in October. I was supposed to go yes. out, and that was like, everything was canceled. And now I'm like, apparently queen of the internet. So, yes, you are. <laughs> and this is why, I guess, the internet. again, if I could just say to people, you know, those of you who, who really do need a lift, you will definitely get a go on Alison's Facebook page. She is fantastic. It is, you can't help but smile. <laughs> she doesn't have to try to be funny. She'll come up with something. It is hilarious and it is, it, it'll do you good to do that. Also, listen to her show, Alison Ardram show on the same, on the channel. You can also catch if you're in Ireland, I should also point out that at 11 o'clock on TG4, which is a national channel, a television channel over here, you will also catch the Little House on the Prairie. So it's really important to do that right now. You do. Okay. Oh, and then I have, I do my comedy show because I couldn't go to the club. So well, there's a thing called Stage It and a lot of performers yes. and singers. Go. So I've got another one, May 8th, uh, stageit.com. That's our Mother's Day theme show I'll be doing. And uh, on May 8th, I'll be, uh, you can go on Stage It and buy a ticket and reserve a Oh, stage. lovely. Well, I'll go, I'll put, um, I'll put a card up at the end of the show with uh, all of this on it as well for people if they want to. I perform in that part of the room. I, I'm right now in this part of the room. I'll go over to that part of the room and have do the stage show. Fantastic. <laughs> but you know, there were so many, I mean, family, gosh, look, fam, our, our own blood can, can give us problems at times uh, and all of us you know, have the same sort of situation, but you also had your little house family. Oh, thank look you. at the pair of that. you there. It's one of my favorite pictures of all time. It's that crawfish. <laughs> and the, I just love that when the expressions on both our faces. Aren't you just fantastic there? And I mean, hasn't Melissa Gilbert grown into the most beautiful woman? She is just stunning. She improved with age. She yeah, was always, she, she was gorgeous, she, but she really. Did. You know, oh, she's raising me. chickens. She's raising chickens out in the countryside now. She, she, she moved to New York and she and Timothy Busfield, they got married. She's in New York. But the pandemic hit and went, they had just bought this little teeny tiny little cabin kind of in the woods up in the Catskills. They thought, oh, for vacations, for this summer, we'll go up to the woods, this little tiny place. It'll be fun. Well, of course, the pandemic hit and they said, we can't stay in New York. We'll, we'll go to the cabin. So suddenly they're like in the forest. It's like a little house on the prairie. It and she is. Thought, I, don't, I don't know how long this is going to go on. So she's planted vegetable garden and then she got chickens. So she's got, she's got a farm. She's doing little house on the prairie. She's got the chickens. She's got the crops. Oh, said, my gosh. Getting I mean, a cow. Are you Could, getting a cow? <laughs> <laughs> Could you rise it? <laughs> now, I have to I have to bring in at this point because I just want to come to the education and and protect org and and um, all the organizations that you are so, so treasured and legendary for supporting. Percival from the Little House on the Prairie, who you married as Nellie married him. Steve Tracy, what a fantastic actor. And I love this picture of him. That's why I put that, I, why I put that up. I think that's a really gorgeous picture of him. Not nice. It was like his acting eight by 10. That's, I think that's one that got him the job of Percival when they said Do you that. think so? What a great guy. And, and what a huge loss that must have been to you. He, well, you're such, when you're married on TV, you either hate each other or love each other, I think. I think all the couples who play married on TV, they either can't stand one another or they become best friends. Yeah. And we were such good friends. And he was such a brave person. I mean, this was a person who, you know, like I said, I've, I've survived two plagues, so, you know, the AIDS pandemic in the, the 80s. Now this, um, when Steve got sick, there was a, a, a one of the many drug trials because back then they had they hardly knew what to do. They were, I think he died before they even came out with AZT. I mean, it was like really early in the pandemic. Uh. And there were a lot of experimental drugs and he signed up and said, absolutely, I'll try one. And there was a drug he was having to do like intramuscular injections, very painful. And um, he said, yes, yeah, some of the people couldn't stay in the study because it hurt too much. The injections are very painful. And I said, but you're still doing this? Oh, yeah, no, no, it doesn't bother me. I'll, I can do it. 
And I was like, God, that's scary. And then I said, do you think it'll work? And he looked at me like I was absolutely crazy and said, oh, no, it's not going to work on me. I said, what? He says, oh, no, I'm far too progressive. It's far too late for me. I'm just doing this so after I'm dead, they can save someone else. Oh, God. That, that is kind just of, so hard, isn't that it? That's kind of man he was. I must have broken your heart. I remember just, uh, 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 and he's like, well, well, I got to do something. But that's the kind of person he was when they yeah. said, well, can we try this drug out? We might get somewhere with this and help other people. He's like, well, what else am I, what, what am I going to do all day? Sure. God bless him. God bless him. And he's still remembered and you're going to make sure he's remembered. And I know everybody who, who knew him, you know, you don't forget these people. You don't mm -hmm. forget what they did for you. Honestly. But you also, as a result, um, not long after he passed, I think you mentioned in the book that it was, was it the AIDS Project Los Angeles that you became yep. involved it, with it, immediately? He was, after? he was still alive because I went, it was the summer. Um, I went to AIDS Project Los Angeles, I signed up for the hotline. In fact, it was during my training, the hotline, he died on Thanksgiving uh, and it was in the middle of training. And they were actually, they said, you know, usually when people come and volunteer because their friend is sick, Usually if the friend dies, they, they don't come back. They just don't come back. And I was like, well, I don't think he'd like that very much. So I said, I think, no, I'll keep coming back. I think he'd be very upset if I suddenly quit and said, oh, well, he's gone. I'm just going to quit now. I said, no, that's you know, why I'm here. And I wound up completing the training and being on the AIDS hotline. And then I was on the speakers bureau and the food, but pretty much everything they had, the food bank, whatever they had Fantastic. to help people living with AIDS in, in, in LA at the time. You have a very strong sense of the real world, don't you, Alison? Yeah, I think so. And I mean, well, you know, I talked about when I went to, because I went to, you call public school, private school, private school, public school. I think yeah, I in the UK, private school is public school. But in Ireland, private school is private school. Oh, okay. Private, <laughs> your private school is the one if your parents have money, they write a big check to you and you, go, you get a little uniform. Public school is the one run by the government you pay for with your taxes and you go with all the rabble and everybody else. And I went to public school and I remember the, the, the elementary school is fine, but the middle school, the junior high was very rough. And I talked about in the book, there was some gangs, it was rough. And I remember saying to my mother's like, I don't know about this place. And she said, well, you're the one who wanted to live in the real world and not go to private school. And she said, you know, you're going to live in the world. Yeah, I mean, you could, I mean, you're on TV show, we could get you into some private school, whatever, but if you're going to public school, you're going to meet all kinds of people. You're going to meet people that are not from your normal, your neighborhood, your family that are completely different than you, whose families are not in show business, that is a whole other world. And that's what you need to do. You need to be able to survive in the real world with regular people, or you're just going to be this little hothouse orchid and you can't go anywhere. So it, better you should go and figure out how to deal with people now. And she was right. And it was, you know, it was, in retrospect, I think a lot of people would have said, I'm not sending my kid there. <laughs> like, yeah, right. But yeah, it did. I mean, absolutely. I, I didn't wind up at, you know, 20 going out into the world and being shocked that, that everybody wasn't the same as me because I had actually, you know, been to public school and met like real people. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, 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 as I mentioned before, and I know we don't know each other, and I have literally got your book to go by <laughs> and this conversation, but I really noticed that you're very good at turning a situation around, at finding a new angle, a, a way to view something that will, will constantly be kind of glass half full rather than glass half empty. And, well, and that is. Had to. <laughs> No, yeah, yeah. Well, I kind of had to because things kept happening. Where I go, well, this isn't very good, is it? So I, I spent a lot of time from literally early childhood going, well, how do I get out of this one? Um, so yeah, I've I've had to kind of say, well, all right, well, these are this here's the cards I've been dealt, and this doesn't look very good right now. I guess I should figure out some way to turn this around. And I mean, even the whole thing of being an ex-child star and being heavily identified with the character. I mean, talk about typecasting, but I sort of turned it on its head because everyone says, well, you're still talking about the and the Prairie and everyone keeps asking about Nellie Olson, Nellie Olson. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, but I've sort of turned it inside out. Yeah. So now yeah. Sort of talking about talking about Nellie Olson and my show is about, well, this is about me. And you see, I also, I was Nellie Olson and, and, how, and what it all means and the whole idea of fame and being a child star and fandom 
And I've been able to take what could have been a box and sort of flip it over and, and turn it into something that I'm able to use for, for my own ends, as it were. Yeah, absolutely. And you do seem to, I, I, look, we, we've all kissed frogs, lots of frogs. And sometimes it takes a little while before you find the right one. <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> and Bob seems to be the right one. <laughs> oh, Bob is great. You got a great picture of him there. Bob is, well, I met him at the hotline and I said, it's like that movie when Harry met Sally because <laughs> Bob and I met at the Southern California AIDS hotline. He was, he was the director, he was running the hotline. I was a volunteer and we got along very well. And we often spoke at panels. They'd say, well, we're all going to you know, UCLA, the university and there's gonna be a big AIDS lecture and Dr. So-and-so will be there and Bob Schoon over the director of the hotline and Alison Arnold on you know, the panel. And so we were always going to the same sort of AIDS events and things. And years went by and I got divorced and Bob broke up with a girlfriend he was living with. This is on and on and on, like this is over years. And literally seven years after we met, we wound up going on a date. We met in 86, we didn't go on a date. For seven years, we knew each other. And we finally went out and most Bob said, well, it's true, we got married rather quickly, but the small talk was really out of the way by then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's been seven years, what's to discuss? And so we, we started, and so um, this November, it'll be, um, oh gosh, 20, uh, tw 28 years. Yes, it'll be. Really? It'll oh be 28 years of marriage this November. Isn't that wonderful? Well, congratulations. That is some achievement. It's some yeah. achievement, isn't it? Right. It's not too many people can say that. And I had to laugh when you were waiting in the car, when you were driving up to get your, your, uh, your vaccination and he kept calling you the squirrel. <laughs> I was so excited. I was so excited. And so we stopped, we stopped for Starbucks. And I, I told the woman when I came up finally to get my shot, I said, I'm kind of vibrating with caffeine and joy right now. I'm so excited. I was like, ah, 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 I get a shot. And he's like, you sound like a squirrel. <laughs> and oh yeah, he got this. So he was like, well, I already have mine. So, um, but yeah, I was so excited. I'm so glad I did it. Oh, I'm so glad. Maybe I, I think I have to wait until June before I get mine. We're, we're very behind here. I'd love the first one. All I want is my first one. Now, protect. Yeah, um, yeah. You, you mentioned your, your abuse, your child's abuse. And um, God, you know, I, I cannot even begin to imagine how that must have been for you. But what an incredible reaction as an adult to come on board with organizations that are absolutely fabulous like this. www.protect.org for anyone who's interested. Now, this will probably be of more interest, of course, to people in the United States and Canada. I should have mentioned you're Canadian. Hi, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm Canada. I'm dual. I'm dual. I am a Canado American, as it were. <laughs> Canado American. Yeah, oh, that's a good word. They, they approached me because they knew all the stuff I'd done, you know, with AIDS and everything else. And um, I don't think they knew I'd, I'd been abused either. It's just like, and I was like, well, you know. Um, and it's just marvelous the stuff they're doing legislatively. They've changed laws in several states at the federal level. The thing that Protect does with veterans, training them in forensics and putting them to work with the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force for the police. And there's all sorts of new stuff. We're coming up with like more weird stuff to do that's just incredible, like fighting child abuse in ways people wouldn't even think of off the top of their heads. Very clever yeah. stuff. I, and, I want to uh, connect uh, the HSC people here who, who would be child protection here. I, I want to connect them with this. I think that would be a, a really good move. But can and you? Yeah, and if you're, I mean, you can see what we're doing. That's the thing is people in other countries can take a look and see like what Protect is doing in our country and see if there's a similar program in your country and all that. And it's just marvelous, marvelous stuff that they're doing. And, and it does feel good to do it. I mean, I knew that oh, yeah. in working, helping people with HIV and AIDS, I remember being at one of the AIDS conferences and they said, you know, they'd done one of the studies they were reporting on they said they did a study where people with AIDS who did volunteer work helping other people with AIDS or did activism political activism that improved the lives of people with AIDS when they medical they did a study where they decided to test them and they actually had a lower viral load and a higher t-cell count they were physically healthier physically healthier and having an effect on their longevity by becoming active and helping other people and doing things to improve their situation, the situation for others. Yeah. And I remember thinking, gee, I wonder if that works with everything else. Yes. And 
absolutely my friends who have volunteered with protect and with other organizations and have done stuff to improve the lot of people who've been abused as children find that their anxiety levels their their medication levels their nightmares their flashbacks anything symptoms they're having yeah. are lessened that they are calmer that they are sleeping better that they find that that the issues and the the physical symptoms they had from all of the trauma and the ptsd is alleviated mm -hmm. somewhat by those actions it really does wonders for you it does and i can identify with that I, i'm a ptsd sufferer myself from time to time and but really i have to sometimes just acknowledge that it is always there and also nocturnal panic attacks and and there will Ooh. be a lot of people yeah very annoying. Really, they really get me down. <laughs> but there are a lot of people in this pandemic who uh, will have found those restarted again at the beginning. Oh, God, if you had any kind of PTSD before this pandemic, it's off the charts now. And they're now saying that because it was especially in the beginning when it was spreading so quickly and it was so terrifying yeah. and people are dying so quick. The people who, for instance, my friends who live in New York, okay, New York people live very close together and all the yeah. hospitals are quite close together. Like here, the nearest hospital is down the road. I'm not going to hear the ambulances in my house. Yes. Because LA is everything spread out. New York, everything's very close together. So in April of 2020, when the cases were skyrocketing, yeah. the ambulances were screaming 24 hours a day. Yes. And there was nowhere you could be in Manhattan where you weren't oh. near to one of the hospitals that you weren't going to hear the ambulances. Oh, yeah, no, I, they, I know. they said it was like September 11th all over again. They said it was horrifying. Yes. Oh, yes. And it would terrible, have immediately connected with that. Of course it would. And, and my friends who lived there who were there during September 11th who said, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I got to get out of the city. This is, this is like the same thing. And the number of people who were, you'd go call your friends and find out your friends were sick, your friends were in the hospital, your friends had died, just like what? And for Bob and I, we're saying it's, reminded us of the early 80s <clears throat> with AIDS because we said okay it's a new disease not sure how it works yet don't have a cure don't have a vaccine um every few days we get a phone call and find out someone we know is sick or in the hospital or has died we yeah. don't know who's going to be next and it's contagious and we're like this all sounds very very familiar, familiar. <laughs> and we're like this is kind of terrifying but and the first few weeks were frightening because you never knew what was going to happen next like I said one morning I was going to be doing the Cherry Blossom Festival RuPaul's Drag Con um, France Ireland etc and the next day I wasn't and yes. then the next day we, we went to go to the grocery store and they were closing they said no we're shutting we don't stay open till seven now we shut down in the middle of the afternoon we're like okay and suddenly you don't know okay now everything is closed okay we went out we saw the last we saw the last show in LA a friend of ours was singing at the club where Bob's band often plays and we went to see her we said you sure you're going on and she said yeah yeah there's still my show. you're sure because it was getting close and we went to see her and after her first set the band went on break and the nightclub announced all bars and nightclubs have just been closed in LA, uh, order the mayor and order the governor as of this moment, but we serve food and restaurants are still open. Well, so far. And then they finished their second set and the manager of the restaurant came out and said, good evening, the governor of California and the mayor of Los Angeles have announced that as of now, all restaurants are closed. So good night, everyone, please leave the building. It's been lovely having you. And that was it. And she, that was, she sang her last song and we all walked out and you know, that club has never reopened. They never, they oh. Really look good. oh gosh. Allison, if I were to ask you, I know it's a big question here and it's one I used to think was very stupid when I was young, but Actually, I was asked it in an interview myself when someone was interviewing me there last month. And, and as an older person, it suddenly meant something to me. Hello. Um, have a go. If you were given five minutes to sit down with your younger self oh. and give some advice, what do you think you might say? Oh, wow. What, 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 what age? Because <laughs> Yes. That's what no. I was thinking in your case. Right. What age? Now, I remember someone said, what would you have told your, your teenage self of like 17 or 18? Um, yes. And I would have said, dump him, dump, dump, dump the guy. Dump, just, just dump him now. Um, absolutely that. Um, younger, um, 
I well, I would say dump the guy. Um, also, um, stay in school. You don't think you want to stay in school and you're going to school on the set and then you're going to school and you're you know not there half the time. So you're thinking of taking that test and leaving school early. Actually, just stay. Stay the extra year. Stay in school. It sounds crazy now, but I, I would told myself stay in school. Um, pretty much 99% of the boyfriends ever said, you should just dump him now. Just save yourself a drift. Just don't break up with him now. Um, <laughs> definitely would have said that. Um, when, when I was really little, yeah, I would have said, um, you're on the right track. This, this is going to end. This will not continue. You will get better. You're absolutely right. Cause that's the thing that's always kept me going. And I talk about in the book is that even when things are horrible, it's like, well, this can't go on like this forever. So it has to improve somehow. Everything changes. So this will change. This will be different and somehow be better. And I would have told myself, yes, you're absolutely right. It is going to be better. Um, but then yes, pretty much from 15 on, I think my advice would have been dump him, dump him now. So there you go. <laughs> oh, Allison, I am so grateful that you came on the show because you are, you're someone who is a tonic and you're a wonderful actress. And I've loved every minute of watching you on screen over the years and has come <laughs> over. That's right. Yes, please. I, I've been told I can come. I can, when, when things open up, um, we're, we're talking about possibly France in October. If numbers, if, because we've got the vaccine numbers, the case, if the case numbers keep going down, the vaccine numbers come up, I should be back in Europe in oh. maybe October. Well, but I'm, we, I'm, we, I'm we, a member, we, I'm a member of a network called the Women's Inspire yes. Network. I, I did my head to do my lecture online and yes, that's I saw the first that. next year I'll do I, had, I did it in my living room over there on the laptop but um if the numbers go the right way I'll be back now of course if everyone's an idiot and screws it all up again eh, eh, I did, next spring but <laughs> we'll well, let's, hope, let's hope Samantha Kelly can get you over it would be wonderful right? if she could <laughs> And look, everybody, we have been so, so fortunate to have Alison Arngrim on the show today. Isn't she wonderful? And I wish you good health. I wish you, Bob, good health and all, all the charities and all the work you're doing. And please, everybody, please get, get on that Facebook page. She'll do you a world of good. Tune into the show. Follow the Alison Arngrim show as well. And I, I tell you, you won't regret it. And please, please, please have a look at this wonderful book, which is Confessions of a Prairie Bitch. And you won't be sorry you read this. This is like a little Bible, particularly for women. <laughs> it's a little Bible. And I'm so glad that, I mean, I'm, I'm not one who is in favor of using the term COVID reading. I don't think it's, it's, a, it's a very fair thing to do to books. But if you are someone who is struggling with PTSD, with nocturnal panic attacks, with anxiety, if you've got an awful lot on your plate and you're not sure what kind of perspective, you need a model sometimes. You need someone who isn't afraid to speak out and say, look, this is what can be done. I've done it. This is where this memoir is exceptional. And I'm absolutely delighted you came on the show and so grateful you. that you thank shared you so your much. story. Alison Arngram, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that interview with the amazing Alison Arngrim. I certainly enjoyed interviewing her. Go get her book. It's Confessions of a Prairie Bitch, and you won't regret spending that money. It's fantastic. Now, just want to ask you if you would like to be a sponsor of Writer's Block with Miriam. So I'm looking for sponsors at the moment. I also have a second show that's starting. It's a business show where people can come on and basically promote their business over a period of about half an hour. Um, and that is a, a show that's called Miri at Midday. It'll be going out on Mondays. If you're a business person and you'd like to come on that show and promote your business and be a sponsor of it, then please get in touch with me. The best way to do that is through my website, which is thekeltris.com, thekeltris.com. Uh, and you can also contact me through YouTube, through Writer's Block the, on the YouTube channel as well. But that is the easiest way to get me. And I check that every day. So I'll talk to you soon. Keep safe and keep watching the shows. Bye bye.